So we've been talking about universal gravitation and orbits in sort of the rational equation way. But you know, the way a lot of this developed is historical. Before we really knew, everybody knew what exactly how it worked, there were all these mathematical descriptions of how things behaved, even if they didn't completely understand them. And of course, the orbits of the planets is the prime case. It's one of the most, the earliest observations that was unusual and that was mysterious and that was important. So the person that explained it was Kepler. Although Kepler used the data from somebody else, Tycho Brahe, and I believe I promised you a Tycho Brahe story very early in this class. So there are many Tycho Brahe stories. Okay, so he was one of these rich nobleman guys, and most of those guys either spent their money partying or doing science or philosophy or something like that. So Tycho uh, did both to the extreme. He partied hard and he did his science hard. He wasn't so much a, uh, a theorist, he, he liked to build things, so he, his main contribution was building, uh, not, a, not a telescope, there weren't telescopes yet, but building uh, a sextant or some apparatus to precisely measure the positions of the stars and uh, the planets in the sky as a function of time. So he had this very detailed data that could be used to figure out how in the heck are the planets moving. Um, but it's the partying that really is the, uh, the memorable part. So of all the stories, I like the one about the moose. So uh, Tycho had a pet moose, and it was kind of like a dog. It just kind of followed him around. He'd ride around his horse. It followed him. It lived in his house. And it sort of it liked to drink beer. You know, it, it, had a, it, it had a beer every now and then with, with Tycho. And this became very uh, popular. Everybody was hearing about it. And this other nobleman was throwing a party, and he said, I got to have the moose at the party. It would be great, you know, impress everyone. So Tycho said, sure, sent the moose. So the moose goes to this party and get really hammered. Right? So the moose is kind of stumbling around, and it fell down some stairs, and it died. It's not funny that it died. I'm not saying that's the funny part. I just think it's my favorite story because it's sort of, uh, it's like Tycho's entire life. If you, just, if you read what else happened to Tycho, it's, it, it's a good uh, summary of Tycho, I think. So that aside, then what happened is Kepler visited Tycho saw all this debauchery and said, oh my God, just give me the data and let me leave, please, right? So, so Kepler got the data, he was a good physicist, he didn't want to party. And, uh, and he figured out how to explain how the, the planets move. And he came up with this three laws of, I guess, planetary motion. So let's look at one. All planets move um, in elliptical orbits. with the sun at a focus of the ellipse. And this really upset people. Everybody wanted the planets to be moving in circles because the heavens were perfect and something, something. But Kepler couldn't, just, there's no way around it. The data clearly said it moves in an ellipse. So for a circle, we already talked about that. That's easy, right? So here's the sun, right? And we talked about how, if you just think of a planet going in a circle, around the sun, you can think about how fast it's going, velocity purport, or perpendicular to the path, and you can say, well, it's gotta have a centripetal force pulling it around, and that must be the force of gravity. And we did that for the moon, etc. cetera. Okay. We didn't really solve it, though. We didn't really solve circular motion with Newton's second law in terms of like writing a solution and plugging in initial conditions. We didn't even do that earlier in the class. We've never done that, and, and the reason is we don't really need to. It, it's sort of, you gotta describe it in other coordinate systems and it gets complicated. So we've always described circular motion this way. We just said that it happens. We never really derived it. So we're definitely not gonna derive elliptical orbits. That's even more complicated. But we're gonna just describe them, okay? So for an elliptical orbit, first of all, the path is an ellipse like that. That's okay. And we'll put it on an axis so we can start labeling things here. Not bad. There's the center of the ellipse. There's nothing at the center of the ellipse. Okay. So an ellipse has two uh, foci, foci here and here. So the sun sits at one of them, like this. And there's the sun, and nothing sits at that one. Okay. And yes, if the sun and the mass of the planet are similar, the things will move around in circles. But still, it's all around this this focus right here. Nothing's here, and nothing's here. The planet is up here somewhere, right? And it's moving along and orbiting. Again, its velocity is uh, tangent you know, to the path. By definition, it has to be, because it's delta x over t. But its force is not perpendicular to the path. 
Force is perpendicular path for uniform, for circular motion. But if you're in elliptical motion, it doesn't have to be. It can be at an angle. What does that mean? That means that the sp it's speeding up. Right? If this uh, force, Fg, is not perpendicular to V, then there's an acceleration along the path. So you don't have a constant V. So we know, we'll do in the other law, that it speeds up as it goes around, then it goes slow out here, and it speeds up as it goes around. Uh, but let's talk about some of the geometrical parameters that describe uh, the ellipse. Some important ones, you might need them for problems. There's this one, A. And A is the semi-major axis. All right, so that's kind of like the long radius. And then there's B. B is the semi-minor axis. That's kind of like the short radius, if you think of this as a squeezed circle. And then finally, there's C. And C is just the, I'm trying to say focal length because I mostly teach optics, but C is the, uh, from the center to the focal point, to the focus. Sorry. I teach optics, not astronomy. Okay, so there's C right there, A, B, and C. And then the one uh, parameter you can kind of put together to characterize how elliptical it is, is the eccentricity. And that is E, and it's equal to C over A. This distance to the focus, C over A. And the reason you use eccentricity is it's a unitless parameter, and as it varies between zero and one, you get different kinds of orbits. So E equals zero is a circle, right? Because imagine over here, what have we done? We've squeezed it together where the sun goes to the center. The focus is at the center, so C is zero. And A is just the radius, so you get zero. But if you take E all the way to one, that's very long. Right? So if we stretch this out, this uh, focus goes closer and closer to this edge, and A just gets bigger and bigger. So basically, as you stretch it, A becomes still as this elongated radius, and this gets closer and closer to the edge relatively. And E approaches 1. So the Earth is pretty close to a circle. So for the Earth, the actual orbit is uh, not a circle. It's an ellipse with an eccentricity of 0.017, so pretty small. But something like, say, Halley's Comet, all right, so comets are the famous uh, thing probably spelled Haley wrong, um, that have this really highly elliptical orbit, and it's 0.9, what is it, 0.97. So it's really out there, and then it speeds up, and it goes way out here, and it speeds up, and it comes in. Right? So those are just some general properties of how we describe realistic orbits. Most orbits are not circular. There's some level they're elliptical.